Welcome back to the School Transportation Nation podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. Our tech tip is brought to you by Zonar. I'm Tony Corpin, publisher of School Transportation News. And I'm Ryan Gray, Editor-in-Chief of School Transportation News. Stay tuned, as a little bit later, I'll be interviewing Zach McKinney, Director of Transportation for Hamilton Southeastern Schools in Indiana, just north of Indianapolis. First, Tony, something that we've been asking our audience to weigh in on is topics. What do they want to hear about? What do they want to know about? So we went to the mailbag this week, and one reader mentioned transportation contracts in New Jersey. Now, we've written and talked a lot about this since COVID-19 first broke back in March, uh, even before then. And there's been a lot of confusion as uh, the contractors especially have been hit hard by the school closures. We see school closures and obviously heading into the fall as well. A lot of the school districts that are going back to all virtual, that has really been negatively impacting business. So we have a reader here who is ostensibly a school bus driver asking, hey, what's the latest? Well, the latest is what has been kind of going on for the last couple of months, frankly. Governor Phil Murphy signed a law back on July 2nd that facilitates the furlough of public employees rather than laying them off full out. This keeps their pensions and health benefits intact during school closures for all virtual classes or if the districts need to close because of some kind of an emergency or God forbid COVID-19 does something in their area that necessitates that. In April, Governor Murphy signed another bill that actually addressed the contractors. It states that school districts must quote, make all reasonable efforts to renegotiate a contract in good faith, unquote, to keep some money at least flowing to the contractors. There is a condition on these negotiations that uh, a contracted service provider shall reveal to the school district whether they are receiving insurance coverage for business interruption during work stoppages. Head over to stnonline.com forward slash coronavirus, or you can go to our website and you can enter into the search field contractors, New Jersey, a slew of articles and resources will come up. Another reader asked us, how efficient are propane buses? Well, I've never maintained one. I've never driven one. So I'm not the best person to answer that question. But what I can do is I can point all of our readers and audience and listeners back to stnonline.com. Go to the search bar, type in propane. We know that propane, when it comes to alternative energy, has really been leading the way for the last couple of years in terms of adoption. So there are a lot of folks making that transition to propane because of reduced maintenance costs that even offset some higher upfront costs compared to diesel. A lot of folks seeing this fuel really helping out with their budgets. Uh, There's obviously to the cheaper um, cost for purchasing the propane compared to diesel or gasoline. So head over to stnonline.com forward slash green dash bus to learn more and understand how propane might help you. Yeah, Ryan, I'd say uh, another tidbit of advice is contact your local bus dealer. Ask them. Also, there's a few different engine manufacturers out there. Roush, Cleantech, Agility. There's a few of them out there. PSI. I know uh, many of the manufacturers have partnerships with different engine manufacturers that make propane. And also the Propane Education Research Council has a slew of resources as well to maybe help out people figure out, you know, is propane the right choice for them? Yeah. Online calculators, we have one. I know Perk has one, but certainly the buyer's guide at stnonline.com. If you head over to our digital magazine tab, you can download and you can get contact information and specs for a lot of those engines that you just mentioned, Tony. So what else was in the news last week? Well, of course, you know, COVID-19 has been with us for seemingly ages now, but Hurricane Laura really ripped the headlines away from COVID-19 as well as the Republican National Convention last week. There was a lot of anxiety as that storm descended upon the Gulf Coast, specifically Louisiana and the northeast 
coast of Texas. Just before that, there was Tropical Storm Marco that at one point was a hurricane and was when it was out in the Gulf. It dissipated enough that it was just, quote unquote, a tropical storm. If you've ever been in a tropical storm, you know that those things get pretty hairy. But then you ramp that up to hurricane force winds and the flooding and the rain that comes with it. So Hurricane Laura actually was a Category 4 when it slammed into the southwest coast of Louisiana last Thursday early and brought 150 mile per hour plus winds, 20 foot storm surge. It was really, really expected to be catastrophic. Luckily, and I say this tongue in cheek a bit, there there were still tragically four deaths, at least at this recording, and thousands of people displaced from Houston all the way up through into New Orleans. But really the the epicenter of the storm hit in Cameron, Louisiana, which is right on the coast there. And then just north of that, St. Charles. So that's what we saw a lot on the news. There was a, a fire at a plant that resulted after the storm passed through. It's now headed up into Arkansas and in the, the Mississippi Valley into the Tennessee Valley and Ohio Valley. It will eventually uh, head out to the Atlantic Ocean. But, you know, certainly something that a lot of schools did not want to deal with on top of COVID. Now, luckily, a lot of schools in that area, they have not opened yet. We've seen a lot of schools have postponed their start date until after Labor Day. There were some districts, though, Beaumont ISD, which is just on the other side of the border with Louisiana. They actually started up two weeks ago and they shut down all last week. The same goes for uh, actually in Calcasieu Parish, which is Lake Charles area. They actually started school on the 24th of August and they promptly shut down for the week because of Hurricane Laura. So still literally the the pieces are, are getting picked up there. The early reports are, again, that it could have been a lot worse for school bus operations and school districts in general. But there are at least two more hurricanes that had just recently formed off the Africa coast, the west coast of Africa there that are now moving their way across the Atlantic. So shaping up to be a busy hurricane season. Yeah, the hits keep coming, Ryan. I don't know if we can catch a break, right? I mean, geez, uh, it brings up vivid memories of the past of like Katrina and what happened there. And I know we had Russell Honore as one of our speakers at the STN Expo years back and just such such vivid memories of that and hitting that area is so hard. And yeah, just all our prayers go out to them and, and their families during that tough time. Really crazy that adverse extreme weather is just impacting the country again at this time. And and I'm sure everybody could use a little breather with COVID going on. But, you know, we got to roll with the punches, I guess. Yeah, it all comes back to preparations I mean, with your fleets, whether you're in a hurricane zone, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, as we're seeing continuing on here in California. It's all about making sure your, your school buses are part of the, the overall, not just district, but community safety plan and the emergency response plan. And it, planning is just never been more important than right now. And speaking of which, Tony, planning we're planning a big event for September, 21st to the 24th, the Virtual Bus Technology Summit. Yeah, Ryan, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I think one of the things with our Bus Technology Summit is we're getting lots of people signing up for it. Like we're right at that 500 attendee mark registered people. That's a lot of people, right? Like that's kind of what we would see almost at a live conference. So people are clearly hungry to connect with others. And, you know, I think the best part about this whole platform that we're putting together is it really provides an opportunity for peers to get back together, right? You've been missing your colleagues sharing those stories. The platform really helps facilitate that. I know everybody thinks Zoom and webinars and you just get fatigued after a while. This is kind of a breath of fresh air. It's, it's, it's such a different way of engaging. It's new to everybody. We're drinking from a fire hose over here, getting this thing ready and not far off, about three weeks out. Be sure to go to BusTechSummit.com to sign up. And speaking of Bus Tech Summit, we have Ian McCurlick with us today, President and CEO of Zonar and Global Head of Commercial Vehicle Fleet Services segment at Continental. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. 
Absolutely. Uh, I want everybody to get excited. Ian is our CEO Tech Talk at the upcoming Bus Technology Summit. He's going to bring a really exciting conversation as our opening keynote address. Ian, you want to give our audience a little sneak preview on what they can expect? Yeah, sure, Tony. First of all, thank you for including us in this uh, first ever event. It's exciting to be trying new technology at Zonar. We love technology. The Bus Technology Summit being remote is super exciting. We're really proud to be part of it and sponsoring it with you guys. Some of the themes that I'm kicking around, and we're a few weeks out from the actual presentation, so your mileage may vary, but I'm really trying to explore three themes that I think are relevant to this audience. Number one, just to step back and think about how has digitization affected different industries and businesses, right? Like, just step way back. I'm old enough to remember, you know, analog phones and prefax machines, right? And we'll go back that far. It won't be that, that much time. But when you look at digitization, it's really had a profound effect on a bunch of different industries. So what can we learn from that and what do we want to take forward in ours? The second thing I want to think about is technology adoption. As business leaders, when do we want to get plugged in? When do we want to make those investments? When do we want to sort of move to the next level of technology? It's a really complicated decision and want to try to unpack that a little bit and perhaps, again, give some examples from other industries and also other parts of the world. One of the privileges I get in my continental role is I get to be involved in fleets in Europe, in China, South America. And I have uh, hope to be able to bring a few insights from how other people around the world are wrestling with some of the same topics. The final theme that I'd love to sort of wrap with is this concept of, at Continental, we call it CASE. There's three megatrends that are really impacting the technology industry. The first one is connectivity, of course. And of course, at Zonar, we've been doing that for, I think, 20 years now, or just about. The other one is autonomy. What does autonomous driving mean and how are people thinking about that in different corners of the globe? The third thing, which is, I think, a little less applicable in the student transportation industry, but super interesting for other forms of transportation might have some effects, is shared, you know, shared infrastructure, shared vehicle assets. What does that mean and and what are the implications of that, both as consumers and what, if any, implications are there for our business experiences? And then the final topic is electrification. What is happening with alternate energy? And how is that likely to unfold? So three big topics. I think we'll explore those a little bit and try to make them as relevant as we can. And uh, I was excited that Tony was explaining before this that uh, we get a chance for some question and answers at the end as well. So I look forward to exploring that with you. Yeah, that's great. I love that word mega trends, right? Like Zonar has been a mega trend maker for nearly 20 years in the pupil transportation industry. So I'm super pumped to hear where your vision is. And yeah, I mean, looking at what other countries are doing or doing some use cases for where other tech is being applied is super interesting to me. I mean, some of the other market verticals have really helped Zonar increase its technology stack and the depth of field. I mean, Ian, what do you see as Zonar's next big thing? Like, where where do you see that headed? The really interesting thing for us is how do we bring more signals, digital signals into our cloud service-based backend and how do we harvest more insights for our customers so that they can manage their businesses more successfully, they can bring better levels of safety to their stakeholders, and how, to, how do we just overall help them be more successful? You know, dots on a map is kind of where we started. We've added systems around keeping track of when students get on and off buses, things of that nature. What other signals, as the engineers like to call it, should we be ingesting in to help our customers be more successful at what they do? So that's, that's where I think the future is going for us. Pretty excited about that. Awesome. Well, hey, everybody want to get you there, BusTechSummit.com to register. If you haven't registered yet, you must. It's free too, so no reason not to show up and hear this great CEO tech talk from Ian McCurlick. Thanks for joining us, Ian. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for including us. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. We're glad to have Zonar, our friends on the podcast today. They are a leader in smart fleet management and the title sponsor of the Bus Tech Summit, and they are providing today's tech tip. School buses aren't so roomy when everyone's trying to stay distant. Screen drivers for symptoms before every shift to lower the risk of contagion. Have drivers fill out a digital health questionnaire using Zonar forms on their tablet. Then securely view the record online to ensure drivers are healthy. 
completely digital, completely contactless, reduce risk for everyone on board. Learn more at zonarsystems.com slash protect. That's zonarsystems.com slash protect. All right, Ryan, six feet, not enough. What do you think? Well, that's according to, guess what? New surveys, new studies coming out. So I had to actually practice this one. So so bear with me, everybody. But some of you might be aware of the name Karl Fluge. He was a German biologist in the 1800s. And really his work is the reason why everyone uses that six foot radius or, or distance to keep people from swapping germs and, and boogeyman and, and whatnot. So a new study came out, read this in the Washington Post uh, last week, came out and said that the guidance to keep six feet of social distance between people is outdated because again, it's, it's based on, on good old Carl's uh, research 200 some odd years ago. It's because that research was not taking into account COVID-19 or a lot of other, frankly, viruses that have come around since then. So what Carl said was that the the distance microbe containing droplets could travel was about six feet. But as demonstrations have shown this summer, we've seen them on the news, different news programs, having health and medical experts demonstrate this, that a lot of times with sneezing and coughing, that these invisible aerosol particles travel much farther. So I've I saw one show that put this dye on this uh, solution and they basically emitted it from the mouth of a dummy and they tried to mimic the cough and it would show how far these particles would go and it went well beyond six feet. So that was, this was something that I think I saw in July and it was talking about, hey, you know, is, is social distancing good enough? So that, that leads to where we are right now with trying to get back to school, right? And looking at some more data, according to the Center on Reinventing Public Education, they said last week that a survey of 477 school districts, a sample that's really indicative of school districts nationwide, so large, small, suburban, rural, 49% of these 477 school districts surveyed said that they are returning to full physical classes. But you need to keep in mind, most of these are in rural areas. Meanwhile, the study shows that 26% of these 477 school districts are starting remote, which includes nearly every large school district in the nation. We've reported previously that of the largest right now, New York City is the only one going back to in-class, and we'll see how long that lasts. And this is also disproportionately and most likely affecting the most high poverty districts in the nation. And so the families that have the most issues getting internet, for example, for their kids, makes the case really for school bus Wi-Fi. Uh, unfortunately, you know, at least according to some of our surveys, it shows that there are very few school districts that are implementing Wi-Fi in general. And even those that have them, they found that they're not using them for COVID-19, that they want to keep them on routes for field trips and whatnot. But again, that service in a lot of areas has been suspended. So, And then meanwhile, also too, 12% of these school districts are implementing a hybrid model. Yeah, Ryan. I mean, I feel like Wi-Fi is so important in terms of student access. We almost take it for granted. It's like drinking water, right? Like internet, like who doesn't have internet? But apparently a lot of people don't. And that's uh, that's a hard thing to live without these days. It's kind of like, you know, imagine life without your cell phone. What was life like before that? It, it's kind of scary to think like, wow, how do we how do we survive without all this instant data at our fingertips? And education has evolved to a level where it's almost like you're at a detriment if you're those students and in the, the gap for those students that are in those kind of socioeconomic challenged areas. That is really unnerving a little bit that those kids are going to get left behind. And that's really not a good thing. And so, I, you know, I would I would challenge the industry to, to really seriously look at investing in Wi-Fi solutions to get Wi-Fi to kids. I feel like that is just so important as part of the learning process. And it's different, right? Wi-Fi on school buses, it's not like the norm, but man, the trend is really moving in that direction. I, I hear more and more people gravitating towards it, but 
Then comes the economic. You know, how do I get funding for it? What are the ways? And betcha, there's lots of ways you can get funding. You just got to call your manufacturers, get a hold of them and talk to them about what are your options? What are the tools and services they have available to you to access this Wi-Fi? Because it's, it's part of the educational process, right? And I definitely have heard a lot more from supplier partners talking about interdepartmental groups working together to help support transportation, like food services supporting transportation with some budget maybe education. We're looking at creative ways to funnel money to transportation to get access to technology to support the student body. Maybe that's even food delivery, right? Like here we are once again, back into the food delivery model. Kind of once we started back in March, now we're thrust back into that model. So I think it's about getting creative, offering services to kids and how transportation is really key to supporting that conversation. So make sure and reach out interdepartmentally to see what you guys can do to integrate and and support the students that you transport every day. It's really important. It's vital. You know, school transportation needs are changing every day. You need an automated intelligence system to help you become faster, safer, and smarter in adjusting to the ever-changing school landscape covered here on the podcast. Fact is, you need to be running super fast. That's where TransFinder's RouteFinder Plus comes in. You don't want a marginal, incremental change to routing. Who wants just a faster horse when you can have a sports car swap incremental for transformational with TransFinder. Plus is your key to delivering accuracy, speed, and savings to your operation. Plus is the most powerful, easy to use routing solution on the market today. Plus features include automation and optimization. Say no to incremental change. Make the transformational transition to TransFinder. Contact them today at getplus at transfinder.com. Put STN Podcast in the subject line to let them know that we sent you. You may just win a prize too. Don't go anywhere. Next, we'll be hearing from Zach McKinney, Director of Transportation from Hamilton Southeastern Schools located northeast of Indianapolis. Thanks for joining us today, Zach. Welcome aboard the School Transportation Nation podcast. How are you doing today? Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate you having me. I'm doing well. Thanks. I understand you've been dealing with some good heat there north of Indianapolis in Fishers, Indiana. That's got to make school bus routes fun. Yeah, it's always fun when we usually when we're in person in August, you have that uh, high heat, high humidity fun times there as we wrap up the summer months and it gets Really, really warm before we have our amazing fall weather kick in. And exacerbating that, of course, with COVID-19, like a lot of school districts, the recommendation is at least to really percolate some airflow on those buses, roll down the windows, because you don't really have much AC, right? That's right. Out of our 320 bus fleet, I would say we're probably limited in maybe 25 of those that actually have air conditioned units on them. So the only AC that we have on those buses is Mother Nature, unfortunately. So we do drop those windows down halfway there to the line and hope for the best on air circulation, obviously twofold right now in COVID. That's to circulate that clean air in and try to get any of those viruses that may be in the the air out those windows, but then also getting the air to cool down our students as we're transporting them each day. And when we were recording this, it was raining, you said. So keeping those windows up, hopefully the the weather temperatures have dropped a little bit. But one of the things that we've been keeping track of is a lot of school bus drivers, of course, they have a lot of anxiety and fear of returning if they haven't done so already. And they're talking about all the different PPE they have to wear, the face masks, the gloves, what have you. There's talk now of barriers plexiglass barriers that are being put up in some areas where those states allow them. What's your feedback from your drivers about these new conditions that they're now trying to navigate with a busload of kids? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you look at this and obviously this is uncharted territory for everyone, right? So this conversation started in our district, in our department back in April, and it's really just reassuring our staff as well as our school community, those students getting on the school bus every day that, hey, safety is number one. So we're going to do anything we can. So we've been gathering face shields, disposable masks, cloth masks, uh, anything we can get our hands on, because ultimately I have to provide different types of PPEs to my staff. So when they come back to work, they're comfortable. So in a staff our size, we have 380 in our department. 
our average age is 55. So as you look at what the CDC is saying, those folks that are in that kind of sweet spot for being susceptible to contracting COVID-19, that's the vast majority of our, our staff population. So obviously making sure we have the right sanitizer, we have the right amount of PPEs that whatever they feel comfortable using, whether it's a combination of several different types, we have to make sure that as servant leaders, we're going out there and obtaining these things to provide them to our staff members. Okay. And speaking of the buses running, the school year actually started a couple weeks ago to full virtual. But I understand after Labor Day, you're going to have some of the kids start going back to to physical class. Yeah, that's correct. August 6th with our first day of school, and it should have been in person, but just with everything developing in our area, we took that and bumped that to virtual only. And now we are looking at transitioning to a hybrid model, which will begin on September 8th. And We'll welcome pre-K through fourth in our district back at a 50-50 model. Those students will return on what we indicate as a red or a blue day. Red students will come on Monday, Tuesday, and alternating Wednesday. And then our blue group of students will attend school Thursday, Friday, and the opposite Wednesday. Okay. So with that, getting those kids back on the buses, what, what are you looking at in terms of reduced capacity? Is there any reduced capacity? Some states or some districts we've seen are saying they can't social distance. They can't ensure that those kids stay six feet or more apart. So they're going back to two per seat. What, what are your routes going to look like when everything gets back and rolling? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously that was early on kind of the conversations of how do we, if we're coming back a hundred percent in a district of 22,000 students and most of those students, you know, usually in, in non COVID times take advantage of our transportation services. How do we social distance? You do the measurement. We run 78 passenger buses that are seated for 72 to do a six foot social distancing from the driver to the back. I mean, we're looking at potentially only transporting 10 students per bus equipment wise nor driver wise is that even possible so with a 50 50 model what that allows us to do is kind of get a small sampling of what it's going to look like moving forward in transportation how we can space those students out how we can group them we are doing assigned seating based on stop location using those devices we're making students wear masks also to make them safe we're trying to group students in sections on the bus that may be from the same community circle so whether they're siblings or their families that may participate in outside activities together they already have kind of that contamination level exposure because they're playing in the neighborhood together. So that's kind of been the direction we've gone because out of just means of logistically, we cannot do six feet distance between students, but we can offer a service that is safe nonetheless. And putting those parameters in place, that's how we feel we can accomplish that. And with the fifth grade through 12th grade, essentially staying at home and doing virtual learning for now indefinitely, whenever that decision is made that those kids can start going back to class, how has that affected your overall ridership? So if you're just transporting kindergarten through fourth, and I would imagine also you have to factor in students whose IEPs require transportation as a related service, homeless kids in foster. So you're able to adequately address that population with your existing 320? Yeah, we definitely can. And so what we did, we surveyed our school community as well, because we wanted to say, hey, are you going to be a car rider this year? And that's as a district we've never done. But we did want them to say, hey, for first semester, my student's not going to ride. You can go ahead and remove their bus services. So we have taken that sampling as well to kind of give us a true estimate on ridership. We're seeing about a 78% ridership at our elementary level, which um, our elementary level students, we have about 7,500 in total in that group. So we do see a drop in ridership there. What we are seeing though, in that to address the five through 12 students that are remaining virtual, as you indicated, there's still some of those students that need services. So our students that are taking the need ENL services, those students that are taking more of hands-on, like our welding and our kind of our job track students, we want to make sure that we can get them in front of a welder. You can't do that through a computer screen, unfortunately. They have to get into school. So some of my drivers that don't have an elementary assigned are assisting in doing some shuttle type services to get our students into the buildings if they need to do a lab or if they need interaction with their exceptional learners to meet the requirements of their IEP we're trying to open that up as well. So I'm able to keep my drivers busy for sure. And, and also keeping our students engaged in in-person learning if that's what they need appropriately to meet their needs. 
Oh, that's that's good. There's a lot of districts I've spoken with across the country that because of driver unions, they're putting the kibosh on any flexibility that uh, directors can have with their drivers and maybe have them help in food service or deliver Wi-Fi or meals or whatnot. So that's good news for you guys. So I want to transition a bit here. I understand you're a former educator and principal. So the $60,000 question I have to ask is, during this COVID-19 <laughs> era that we're in, what would you rather be, a teacher or a director of transportation? I'll tell you what, I, I mean, it doesn't matter at this point, no matter what hat you wear in education, you face difficulties that are unparalleled to anything else. And I know that, you know, teachers catch a lot of flack from, oh, they can work from home. It's not that easy. Having been in all those various roles from a teacher and earlier in my career to a building level administrator, I mean, our teachers are faced with an undaunting task. In our household, just personally, I have a first grade student, so I could only imagine what it's like to corral, you know, 24 first graders onto a Zoom call and not, you're not only dealing with the distractions you would have in a classroom, but the distractions of their home environment and what's going on. I mean, we, we have two dogs, so I totally know that, you know, my boxer is probably up there bugging him in the middle of a Zoom, no doubt. So, I mean, from a teacher standpoint, I just, you know, I commend them for what they're doing. They are faced with a task that is not, and it's a moving target too. So not only are they having to adapt and change their pedagogy of what they're doing and how they meet the needs of their students, but that has to evolve as we go to a 50-50 model, you'll have students that will be in person, but then students that will be with that teacher also virtually. So they have, in our district, a huge task placed in front of them, but the professional development they've been offered, and we have a tremendous teaching core in our district, so I have no doubt that they're going to you know, shine through this. And I know that from a personal level, as a parent, my students have had a phenomenal experience with virtual instruction to this point. Yeah, we would love to see them in person, but ultimately, we have to do that safely, and we're just not there at the moment as a district and as, you know, as a state, as we're seeing numbers over a thousand new cases being reported on a daily basis, it's just, it's unbelievable. So to answer that, I guess, Ryan, I would say that no position is easy, but as a teacher, the workload that they're taking on is tremendous. And I commend them for what they're doing. Definitely trying to get our students prepared and obviously keep that gap as low as we can as we continue through the progression of education for them. I would say also that, and I'll make the leap here in that you mentioned distractions, right? School bus drivers are facing tons more distractions than most, let's be honest, most folks in the school district encounter during a normal school day with what, you know, you have 60 some odd kids behind you, the traffic around you, you're driving this huge vehicle, the radio dispatch barking at you. So if if anything, maybe it provides some clarity to some folks out there in the rest of the educational world about what school bus drivers deal with every day. And speaking of which, so with school bus drivers, and you mentioned also professional development, during this time, it sounds like most, if not all, your school bus drivers are back reporting to work. If not driving buses, they're doing some something to stay busy. How do you stay on top of training during this time too, when, especially when everything seems to change daily and what is said and recommended one day changes the next? How do you address that with school bus drivers? Keep them on the cutting edge, keep yourself on the cutting edge, as well as you know, work with some of that frustration that probably comes from that. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, if not that I can say there's been many blessings that have come out of COVID. In fact, I can only honestly speak to one, and that is the professional development that I've been able to get to my drivers. So when we went into shutdown back in the spring, like many, I'm like, oh, this, you know, after spring break, we're going to be back. This will be fine. That didn't happen, right? So to shift then and get something done for our drivers, we couldn't do. We continued to pay them like many districts in our area did. But as we jumped forward through the summer, And knowing that we were going to start virtually, I'm like, this is my time that I can capture my staff. In past years, I would only have one day of staff development, and that's my back-to-school meeting. Well, as you know, in this business, there are so many things to cover. As a building principal, I had PD time with my teachers weekly, if not daily, as we walked through things to try to help with their practices to improve what they do to offer the students. And I just, I don't have that connection with my drivers because, again, I have them for four and a half hours, and that entire time I have them, 
they're driving a school bus. So I really pushed for a PD calendar through the month of August. And I had my drivers engage with some online coursework to improve their practices on how to deal with disruptive student behavior. You mentioned it, Ryan. It's like, you know, you drive on vacation with your own family load of kids. What I try to tell people when they come in to be a bus driver, what does that take? It's not just, hey, here's keys to a, a large vehicle and have at it. I mean, there's some training and there's definitely some things that go along with that. But you look at, you mentioned it, all of the students sitting behind you and the noise and everything else. I mean, there's a lot to take in. And so I, I took the month of August and we really looked at professional development as far as COVID and, you know, getting things to them that, hey, this is what you're going to have to do to keep your students healthy, to keep yourself healthy. We did some YouTube videos on how to disinfect the bus. I did some kind of some online tutorials for them of things that are going to change in our department how we're making some different modifications to how they enter and exit the parking lot and that sort of thing. So we really use, we were paying them for the month of August and I used that time frame to really take what I never had before. And that was just time with my drivers. And I would put out these different assignments each day and that's what they had to do for me. And it, I got some positive feedback because again, they all want that training, but when do you find time as a director of transportation to offer that to them and drivers, when do they have that availability as well? Well, no better time than the present, as you said. So That's right. Well, thank you so much, Zach, Director of Transportation for Hamilton Southeastern Schools in Fishers, Indiana, as well as the Director at Large for the School Transportation Association of Indiana. Thanks again, Zach. Really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your insights and perspectives with us. Yeah, Ryan, I appreciate the opportunity and definitely love connecting with you when I attend the conferences. So thanks for this as well. And we're going to miss you. We were going to see you. Hopefully we were still hoping in, in October that's been canceled, but let's reset and all steam ahead for 2021. That's let's right. get a vaccine. Let's get some testing for all the kids that we need. And hopefully we can get back on track. In the anticipation for 2021, we're ready for STN to be back in Indy. Awesome. Thank you so much again for joining us on the podcast today. And thanks to my co-host, Tony Corpin, and to our sponsors, TransFinder and Zonar. We appreciate all our listeners and we want to hear from you. So email us your questions, your comments, things you want us to talk about to info at stnmedia.com and we'll try to address them in an upcoming episode. Visit stnpodcast.com to hear all our previous episodes. Subscribe on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and don't forget to leave us a five-star review. And head over to our site at stnonline.com for the latest news and perspectives on school buses, the coronavirus, and school startup. See you next time.